Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Do animals know more about the paranormal than we do? Did the groundhog see his shadow this morning? What does he know about the weather anyway? Greetings and welcome to the 572nd edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I am Ben and those beastly questions came from my co-host and partner in the paranormal, my dad. And this evening we bring you a subject that we've touched on before but with uh, some new cases and information. We welcome your calls this evening. Uh, numbers to uh, call, that's 800-449-1240. That's from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Or 401-766-1240. That is locally. Also, we will monitor emails. Uh, Paul at BehindTheParanormal.com. Okay. Well, today is Groundhog Day, and legend has it that the Groundhog, a member of the Shuriday family, I should say, of rodents, and otherwise known as the woodchuck, whistle pig, and land beaver, emerges from his burrow on this day. If he sees his shadow, he will say, the heck with it, and go back indoors and hibernate for another six weeks. That means we will enjoy six weeks uh, more of winter. Sometimes I feel like saying, the heck with it, just walking back inside and going back to sleep. But while groundhogs are very common in New England, uh, we had two of them at our own uh, old place back in Cumberland, Rhode Island. Um, the most famous weather uh, prognosticator of all is undoubtedly Punxsutawney Phil. And this morning in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, we need more peas in that sentence. <laughs> in uh, one of America's biggest uh, one-day folk tourist attractions, Phil did uh, see his shadow. And uh, at least according to his uh, top-hatted handlers, well, there are just so many alliterations. According to uh, tradition, that means that we will have six more weeks of winter. Well, you know, I often wondered, I mean, how can you see a shadow on a day like today? Even in Pennsylvania, it was cloudy, probably snowing. And uh, anyway, but that, but that it is, you can't argue with tradition. You cannot argue with Punxsutawney Phil. No, I tried once, it didn't work. Now, all this might seem like tourist type, and of course it is, but as we often say on the show... Every story from folklore has some grain of truth that started it off. Groundhog lore, however, is a, is a little bit hard to trace. The first reference to the groundhog legend in America, at least that we've been able to find, dates to February 4th, 1841. Like many people at the time, James Morris of Morgantown, Pennsylvania, always Pennsylvania, kept a written diary. On that day, he recorded this. Quote, last Tuesday, the second, was Candlemas Day, the day on which, according to the Germans, the groundhog peeps out of his winter quarters, and if he sees his shadow, he pops back for another six weeks' nap. But if the day be cloudy, he remains out, as the weather is to be moderate. Unquote. So Candlemas, by the way, has nothing to do with groundhogs. It's a day that uh, celebrates several significant event, uh, events in the life of uh, Jesus. Actually, the early life of Jesus. Early life of Jesus, I yeah. should say. Yeah. Nobody is certain just how this folk belief about the groundhog and the weather got started, but if you look at the calendar, the actual beginning of spring on our calendar, uh, the spring equinox, that is, is six to seven weeks after February 2nd, which the Celts considered the first day of spring. The equinox, they considered the middle of spring. So in other words, if you happen to live in, I suppose, uh, northern France and um, uh, the, before the time of the Romans, around the time of the Romans, you would consider that spring began begins today. As I say, you never have weather like we would, you never know it. So I think the whole groundhog six week thing is a folkish tangle of two calendars. Uh, does that make sense, Ben? Uh, it makes sense, but I wonder why groundhogs. They, well, they do hibernate, and they are a lot safer to observe close up than bears. But uh, Orthodox Christians in uh, Serbia apparently aren't so cautious. On uh, February 2nd, on the Julian calendar, they celebrate the Feast of the Meeting of the Lord, where Jesus, as a boy, meets the prophet Simeon. Uh, on the, on the uh, same day, they believe the bear emerges from hibernation. If old Bruin meets its uh, shadow... He will go back to sleep for 40 more days, uh, they believe. Aside from groundhogs and bears and old-timers uh, wa still watching ladybugs, cows, frogs, ants, sheep, and other woolly bear uh, caterpillars for signs of weather as well. Yeah, and I, I grew up with, in the Connecticut Valley in the tobacco country, and all the old-timers would come out and say, Oh, look at those woolly bear calendars. It's going to be a bad winter. And, you know, a lot, a lot of times they'd be right. Of course, that makes sense, I suppose, because nature... Uh, it isn't necessarily paranormal, but we believe the paranormal is, in a, is part of nature, maybe even its whole background, that, uh, that these things uh, are all connected and, and are in communication, so to speak, with one another. But anyway, um, 
I suppose we, we very narrowly perceive the paranormal, but the question is, is there really a deeper connection between it and animals? Well, dogs, cats, and horses have long had reputations for being able to sense the presence of the unseen, so to speak. Of course, those are the animals that most commonly rub elbows, or, or in this case, paws, hoofs, whatever, with humans, so we can observe them more closely. We don't see any reason to believe that other animals aren't just as sensitive, but uh, that's what it, it really is, is all about, is the sensitivity. And, the, and we see those animals more frequently, the dogs, cats, and horses. The effects of electromagnetic fields on animals have been well documented, and we believe these EMFs have a great deal to do with the boundaries of the parallel worlds whose interaction is responsible, Ben and I believe, for what people call the paranormal phenomena. But that can't entirely explain a fellow investigator I worked with during 2000. Uh, these were years before Ben uh, became uh, my partner. Before I became Ben, you see. Yeah, it, <laughs> you, were, you were Ben, very much so. But uh, anyway, I referred to Wyatt, the world's only ghost hunting dog. Now, you, you were... What? You, you were like eight, seven, eight years old in 2000, right, Ben? I think so, yeah. Some, yeah. Somewhere around there. Yeah. But, and you remember Wyatt the dog. I do. I miss Wyatt. Well, he and I had a sort of secret life, okay? Uh, not knowing about his psychic talents, uh, we adopted Wyatt, who was a four-year-old Australian shepherd, which I'd never heard of before, simply because Ben and his older brother wanted a dog. Now, I myself am a cat man from way back, but I, I gave in. And Wyatt turned out to be personable, uh, well-behaved, and he literally never barked. Maybe the only time I ever heard him, the only time I ever heard him bark was when I accidentally stepped on his foot. Uh, other than that, never, never heard his voice. A man of a uh, dog, a few words. Anyway, we never even, um, well, anyway, he was civic-minded as well, doing a fine job of clearing the can of the geese uh, off Tucker Field in Cumberland, Rhode Island, at least once a week. But one day that spring, I had a rather nasty case in Northbridge, Massachusetts. You were in school, of course. Uh, and I brought Wyatt along, intending to leave him in the car. Now, there were several frightened children at the house in question, uh, and they asked if Wyatt could come in and play with them. He was willing, but seemed very nervous as we entered the house, which I immediately felt was hot, so to speak, with paranormal energy, most of it negative. Now, Wyatt couldn't keep his mind on the children, and within a minute he had rushed down to the bathroom where he stood shaking and alternately looking at me and the room. As soon as he saw that I'd noticed, he ran up the stairs to a bedroom on the second floor doing the same thing and shaking all the while. He later found, or we later found, that there had been a, a suicide in that bathroom within our own uh, conscious past, so to speak, because sometimes we find these things are occurring in parallel realities and people don't have any memory of them or, or even in the future and that the person had lived in the bedroom why it had pinpointed this perky pooch saved me a pile of work to say the least now his ghost hunting career was brief because i quickly became worried about his nerves and his early retirement resulted do you remember ben how he got really kind of antsy and not acting right i do remember that yes I yeah th i think that was actually sort of after he hit his head well, that didn't help either. No, I don't think it helped yeah. either. But I don't think this, this helped as well. And I've seen animals in several cases. There was another case in Woonsocket uh, some years back. This is the case uh, which I first met uh, Shane Searway, who has become a good friend. And I thought, oh, Jesus, this is another one of these ghost hunter types. But actually, a very, very serious researcher, a uh, young fellow uh, with great wisdom. And uh, he has, uh, as a matter of fact, we brought him in on one or two cases since then. And uh, there was a dog in that case uh, that sensed something and it was very negative it was as i say it was here in one socket i won't say where but he the, the dog was a little poodle and would bark at this particular corner or certain areas of the room where we couldn't see anything and the dog ended up um really because he was no spring chicken but he wasn't that old and his his hair began to fall out and he became became extremely nervous and eventually died uh so it was uh, it was very sad in that situation but animals are really uh, really are very sensitive to these things because they're aware of, of various um, uh, energies. Now, um, Ben remembers when I, it was a certain book that I edited uh, for someone, and it was uh, having to do with horses. And uh, it, 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 I remember that there was some research done in connection with this book, not by me, but uh, I took advantage of it, uh, that um, the bioelectric field around all living things, really around all things, is particularly uh, uh, extensive in horses. In other words, they, they, could, they not only will hear you coming 
or see you coming, they, they will, there will come a point where they will, will connect with your bioelectric field. Now, you know, this isn't paranormal or occult. This is a scientific fact. People have a DC electrical field, direct current electrical field, around their bodies, and, and so do all living things. This is part of our biology. And uh, I think that this is how... Uh, you feel the presence of someone, or you, you know you're in a room and you're not alone, that kind of thing. I think that bioelectric field alerts you to that, or at least is one of the things that is responsible for what we might call certain kinds of sensitivity or even extrasensory perception, uh, perhaps. So um, anyway, the, uh, the animals um, seem to have uh, not had that educated out of them. You know what I mean, Ben? Uh, you know, you, you go, you, children, little children are very aware of these things, um, I can tell you a number of children I've dealt with who are very aware of paranormal things going on around them. Mm. And then when they get to school, they learn science and say, oh, it doesn't exist, and, and uh, you know, that, that's something you shouldn't pay attention to, and you're being childish and all this business, when, when in fact, they, they are the ones in touch with the reality, and we very often are not. So this, um, again, uh, may have something to do with this bioelectric field. So anyway, why it's apparently was, was very active. Um, so there you go. So what about the, the uh, what about anim, uh, animal ghosts, I should say? Because I know the question has come up in your career multiple, multiple, multiple times, and I don't think we ever really gave an answer to that. Well, not really. We've touched on it several times in the show, but it's, you know, we're in our seventh season here, so maybe we ought to deal with it. Um, certainly, and of course, certainly as we go here, listeners are invited to call in with any animal ghost experiences they might have had or any other strange animal experiences, period. And uh, the number is again eight hundred four four nine one two four zero from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, and uh, within uh, the local area certainly four zero one seven six six one two four zero. So anyway, uh, I have run into this a number of times, uh, and there have been some really strange cases that are very inspiring, really, because they point out a great loyalty and love that animals have uh, for humans. Um, Anyway, while, while doing research in England in 1989, this case comes to mind, uh, I, was, I was there researching the uh, Beast of Exmoor, which, which is a rather dramatic English name for what appeared to be a black panther, which, of course, is, is not native to, to Britain. It doesn't really belong there. Um, I ran into the case at the same time of Congleton's Ghost Cat, now, Congleton is a village in Yorkshire, and I heard the story from a woman who said she was a descendant of the person who had the, the experience. Uh, that woman's name was Louise Marlowe. The story has come down through the years in that family. So it was the early 19th century, so this goes way back, Mrs. Marlowe and a friend rented a pony cart in Congleton, I guess the, the, the early... Uh, um, ancestor of the car rental company is uh, the original pony cart then and they rented that in Congleton to take a ride in the country they noticed some beautiful wild roses near some old ruins uh, to stop uh, and, and, and they decided to stop and pick some now my informant only said these were the ruins of some old English abbey and because that could be anywhere uh, and then an abbey by the way is a combination sort of church and monastery and uh, but I've never I have yet to be able I've yet to identify the exact ruins where this occurred. But as the women approached, they saw a huge white cat on top of a post at what uh, would have been the Abbey Gate. Now, being cat fanciers, they wanted to pet this fetching feline. But as soon as they closed in, the cat supposedly leaped from the post and disappeared in midair. And they claimed that there was nowhere the cat could have hidden. They, they made a particular note that the grass was very short there, so it's not like the cat could just jump into the, any kind of tall grass. So two days later, they drove past the same spot and saw this cat again, sitting on the same post. Uh, the cat watched them approach, so it, it could perceive them. We, we often notice that if um, someone or some thing or whatever is, is uh, if you're having a parallel world experience, very often they can't see you, or they, or they don't see you, or they're afraid of you because they think you're a ghost and all this kind of thing. It works both ways. So anyway, this, this beautiful white cat watched them approach, and then it slowly faded away. So more unnerved than they had been before, they stopped in the village for something to eat and mentioned the cat to the woman who had, was, was the waitress. Now, she only smiled. Uh, I hate, hate that when people smile knowingly and say nothing else. But a woman at the next table happened to overhear and asked if this, if this had been a white cat. When Mrs. Marlowe said, yes, it had been, 
the woman said something like, you drove by at the right time to see Congleton's cat. So, in fact, the woman um, uh, had a woman had li- or th- this particular woman had lived in Congleton for over fifty years and had known the cat when it was alive. It had belonged to a Mrs. Wing, a housekeeper at the Abbey. And one day, the cat didn't come home. I, could, uh, I guess, you know, and I asked this person. I said, "Well, the Abbey has been ruined for hundred years, hundreds or hundreds of years or so." She said. Well, you know, it's partially, it was still being used by some monks, and people would go to church there, but a lot of it was in ruins, so I guess it was really old. I, know, I, I get the historical stuff in there, too. So anyway, one day the cat uh, didn't come home, so this Mrs. Wing felt certain it had been killed by one of the roving packs of dogs that were a problem in the area. She was relieved uh, when she heard a mewing or meowing at the door uh, one, one uh, night, and then when she opened it, there was Kitty, uh, but there was something wrong, she sensed. The cat refused to enter the house, and then it disappeared right in front of her. The same thing happened night after night. So Mrs. Wing, uh, a bit worn out by this, felt that her this pet that she really loved a lot was now a ghost. And she stopped answering the door when she heard the cat and soon left for parts unknown. Supposedly she apparently wanted to uh, love cats, but felt that the living ones were better in one's company than, than ones that were not. Anyway, the cat had been appearing to people at the site ever since, off and on. And uh, at the time of my 1989 <clears throat> conversation, the most recent sighting had been in 1988, the year before. Now, th- th- this has arrived because there is some evidence that these in- incidents inspired the Cheshire Cat in Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, first published in 1865. And uh, the woman I was talking to said she, she herself was very sure that that had occurred because they had found a clipping uh, in Lewis Carroll's papers after he died uh, of this incident. And uh, the cat fading away and the whole business, if you're familiar with the Alice in Wonderland story, the Cheshire Cat disappears part by part until finally only his smile is visible and then that disappears. Now that apparently wasn't the case in Congleton, but uh, maybe um, Carol used some literary license on that. But that, that, that's kind of just as cool as the story that um, the uh, vampire cases in Exeter, Rhode Island uh, were known by Bram Stoker and were one of the inspirations for his story Dracula. So, but, the, but Dracula wasn't an animal, at least, well, at least not most of the time. So we'll pass on that. So anyway, I run into reports of ghostly pets every time I turn around, and I'm sure Ben does too, and there seem to be plenty here in Rhode Island and in the nearby areas of New England. So um, <clears throat> there we are. So many people don't realize that the uh, dog Lad, in the famous book Lad, uh, a dog was uh, a real dog, and uh, that the author had an amazing pet ghost experience. Yeah, that's true. That, that was in New Jersey, and it really shook him up, as I understand it. The author was Albert Payson Terhew, and I believe that's how you pronounce that. He was a breeder of collies in New Jersey, and Lad was one of these collies, so Lad really existed. Uh, kids today probably don't read that book, but we, we had to. Uh, yeah, I've, never, I've, I've only heard of the book like once. I've never read it. Well, at least you've heard of it. That's something. Yeah. Well, anyway, he was pretty famous at the time. Uh, so uh, Mr. Turhune also had a big uh, collie and bull terrier mix. Uh, what, what would that look like? A furry pig? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, th- this, this um, br- mixed breed dog was named Rex. And this Rex was crazy about Mr. Turhune and would lay at his feet when he had a guest or was writing. Uh, Lad, it was, obviously he was a writer as well as raising dogs. So Lad and Rex always had some diplomatic issues, and in 1916, they got into a giant fight. Turhune couldn't stop the fight, and Rex just, like, went out of his gourd completely. He ended up attacking Turhune. And the man had to grab a knife to protect himself. And, and in, in the scuffle, he ended up stabbing Rex. Uh, and Lad recovered, but Rex did not. And Turian was devastated because he loved all his dogs, even this furry pig one here. So a year later, some friends happened to be visiting the, this farm in New Jersey, which was, uh, I can't remember, it was um, Sunny, Sunny Bank, Sunny Bank Farm, which I guess is, is in the book, so, but it was a real place, too. Anyway, uh, these people were visiting, and one of them suddenly remarked that Rex must really be devoted to Turhune. He said, as, as he was watching the dog at the author's feet, and the dog was gazing up at, at, at Turhune uh, with great devotion, 
Tyrion was stunned, and he told his friend that Rex was dead. Now it was the visitor's turn to be stunned. Well, I never knew that. I was looking right at him. And, of course, as the conversation took place, the dog disappeared. So that kind of shook everybody up. Perhaps it was an early evening. So that wasn't the end of it. Uh, a month later, there was a gathering of Tyrion's, and a guest, um, I guess, uh, noticed that a collie uh, mix kind of dog was uh, staring at them through a, a window. I guess it was a French-style window that extended you know, the whole length of the wall. Um, so pretty freaked by this time, uh, Trihune said he didn't know any such dog. So by then, uh, the guy was convinced not only that Rex was haunting uh, his house and farm, but that all his colleagues knew it. Uh, for years, they never approached a, approached a rug in the author's study that had been Rex's personal spot. And he used to, uh, the dog would you know, sit there and nobody, and so for, for years, the dog uh, w- wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Now, of course, the question uh, arises, okay, well, what is this? I mean, uh, people generally think that uh, that uh, people have souls, but animals do not. So we'll get into that a little bit later. But I remember Ben, uh, we've, we've talked about this several times. When one of our cats, we had a lot of cats at our old place in Cumberland, and uh, one of them uh, had, was died, and uh, it was the alpha. Now, interestingly, they were both male and female alphas, and our cat herd flock. I don't know what you call a bunch of cats. And uh, they they would alternate somehow, not not by gender, but you never knew who was going to be the dominant one. And uh, the alpha died, happened to be female. And as I was uh, removing her body, uh, taking it for burial, uh, all the cats stood around in a circle, uh, very reverently, didn't make any noise. And uh, then the um, the new alpha apparently, which was a gray big gray male, gray bear, if you remember him. Uh, came up to me and rubbed against me. You know, only the alpha was, uh, they were all friendly, but only the alpha w- would come and, and rub against uh, the humans in our family. And uh, that, that obviously was very interesting because it meant they, they were sort of the dominant ones. So uh, the cats followed me over to the grave site, stood around in a circle as I buried the body. Uh, it, was, it happened to be uh, Kitty Wells was the uh, name of the cat. We used to have interesting names for our cats. And uh, the, the, the they would one of them stood by that grave for days. They would take turns actually doing that uh, after that. And then um, it, very much in in the uh, the Rex case, uh, there was a certain place where um, uh, Kitty Wells would uh, sort of hold court. You remember that great big back deck we had between uh, the shed that was my office at the time and the house, and there would be <clears throat> um, a cushion there, uh, really an outdoor. Uh, you know, lawn chair kind of cushion, and I, we left that there for the cat. And Kitty Wells would sit there, and the others would kind of sit around her. And I always felt they were conversing, even though it was great, it was very silent. But the uh, the cats continued to do that, and they never took her spot. They always would sit where they would sit when she was there. So you wonder, did they see something or know something that, something that we did? But in any case, it is time for our break, and we will um, be, 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 be excuse me <clears throat> be back to talk about animals and their paranormal connections and knowledge or whatever uh, very shortly. But you're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WOON 1240 and streaming live on onworldwide.com. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. This is your Mater D in the Tiki Bar, Joe Callahan, inviting you into the Tiki Bar every Tuesday night from 6 until 7 p.m. It's nothing but the best in Jimmy Buffett music for the full hour, 6 to 7, Tuesday nights, right here on ON Radio. The Tiki Bar is brought to you by Papa John's Pizza, 1049 Pass Avenue on the corner of Menden Road here in Woonsocket. Remember, better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's. It's the Tiki Bar right here on ON 1240 WON Woonsocket Radio every Tuesday night from 6 to 7. Okay, and uh, that, we're back with uh, Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno, and uh, we're talking about paranormal animals, animals and the paranormal tonight. And before we get back to our conversation, we just wanted to remind you of several of the charities Ben and I have adopted on the show. Uh, one, of course, being Builders Helping Heroes. That's a local charity uh, run by the Rhode Island Builders Association, and they do wonderful things for veterans and their families when it comes to remodeling and construction. Uh, they even built a great house uh, a couple of years ago out in Burrowville, 
for a, uh, a very brave Marine who had lost both his legs in Afghanistan. And uh, they were just, and as they moved in, they were just about to have a baby. So talk about perfect timing. And it was, I was privileged to be there. Wonderful, wonderful thing and great people. And uh, that's buildershelpingheroes.org. Uh, also, usacares.org, doing great things for veterans uh, financially. And uh, that's a national organization. So check that out at um, usacares.org. Also to uh, the north, our friends to the north, the Canadian Veterans Advocacy, uh, Mike Blaze in Ontario doing a great job of advocacy for veterans in Canada who don't always have a lot of the, um, well, uh, maybe not, well, they have, they have some benefits, of course, but uh, they are, I don't know if they, well, they're treated well, but uh, I don't know, I, I just, I have some personal uh, feelings about the Canadian veterans that um, I, I feel that, that they're not treated as, as well as they could be. Um, great country that it is. But anyway, check that out, too. That's CanadianVeteransAdvocacy.org. Uh, so anyway, great stuff going on uh, for our veterans. And also in, out in Los Angeles, Youth Mentoring Connection, YouthMentoring.org. Uh, Tony Lurie out there doing great things for at-risk youth using ancient wisdom. And again, nothing occult about it or strange, just good common sense from our remote ancestors uh, that these young people really seem to respond to in some of the um, areas of L.A. that need it the most. Okay, so let's get back to our stories of, uh, of animals, and we, uh, the, the stories of pets who have never left kind of go on and on. Now, uh, if you look back uh, over some cases we talk about a lot on the show, uh, there are some that have animals involved that we haven't said an awful lot about. Now, my first case uh, documented in my book, Faces at the Window, took place 1970 through 1972, and involved an abandoned village in Pomfret, Connecticut, right in our show listening area. There were many contacts with uh, what I later came to believe were time slips and their contacts with people from what we conceive as the past, not the ghosts of dead people. I began That first case got me questioning everything. But in the experience there, uh, for me, those uh, who were with me, uh, there were six or seven, uh, usually seminary students, as I was at the time, and one photo expert, uh, and for many other people who have visited that site in subsequent years, um, th- there was uh, there were many ghostly dog and cow sounds as well, and probably horses too. I mean, as I say, you, the, when we first walked in there, it was a hot August day in August of 1971, and you could hear dogs and and farm implements banging together and and cows, and uh, we. Ex- ex- explored the area extensively, and there was no one uh, there, no no uh, uh, human presence really for like half a mile at least, so you wouldn't hear a cow like 30 or 40 feet away, or a dog, people talking as well. Uh, but in one case, uh, we had these invisible horses pulling an invisible wagon with an invisible driver shouting, yeah, went right by us, you know, it was amazing. So as I say, this is my first case, and it started me wondering, you know, is the old spirits of the dead explanation for ghost phenomena uh, valid at all? And uh, today I don't believe that it is. But animals uh, are very often present in a lot of cases that that may be famous, uh, but that uh, are not generally talked about because people are concentrating on the human aspect. So what about um, going beyond ghost pets and phantom deer and all that good stuff? I'd be skipping ahead a little bit because... um, Actually, wait, where, where, where am I? Where, what am I talking about? I'm talking about... <laughs> We're what, going beyond domestic animals, Ben. Indeed, we are going, yeah. on, going beyond domestic okay. animals. But really, the thing that, that always pops up in my head, because uh, you never really, really um, mention, mention it as much, or maybe it's because I'm just not paying attention most of the time. Oh, thanks um, a lot. No, no, well, I pay attention, but, you know, I've heard the story so many times that I'm, I'm not in that frame of mind of thinking, oh, whoa, ghost animals. I'm usually like, oh, there's all sorts of stuff going on, and I've never really focus on that particular aspect of it like for example um uh the the uh the so-called uh, talking cat from the bridgeport case oh yeah yeah that's true well that that i don't think that was was really a talking cat uh the, in the bridgeport case which is expounded upon very very well by our good friend the author bill hall william j hall uh in the book um the uh, world's most haunted house which is, uh, I, as I understand it, is becoming a bestseller now. Uh, they're really uh, very pleased that uh, the publisher, uh, New Page Books, so you, you can find it pretty much in any Barnes & Noble or any place like that, or certainly online. Uh, in, in, I was involved in that case with Ed Lorraine Warren, and that was in 1974, and one of the many, many things that was going on, I mean, I was injured by a flying television set, and all this stuff was going on. But in the background was the little girl, who seemed to be the center of this case, uh, and her cat, 
And this cat was, in my opinion, an ordinary cat, but it was supposedly able to speak. Now, it wasn't just the little girl who said that. It was the man, uh, Gerard Gooden, who was her, the, her uh, adoptive father. And he swore that, he said, that cat will come up to the top of the cellar stairs, the door was closed, pound on the door, and say, open this door, you dirty Frenchman, you dirty rat. Okay, <laughs> that's a quote supposedly, and I said, you know, I mean, really. And he said, no. I said, and he, this this fellow was was a, a a good man, a good hard worker, supported the family. He wasn't uh, prone to drinking. Uh, he had sort of a feet on the ground thing, and was was just depressed and upset that this was happening in his home. And of course, the reason it's a famous case is because uh, the Warrens uh, were not hesitant to talk to the press and the media from all over the world was was involved in this case uh and as a matter of fact the, probably the, the picture i will never forget most of all the pictures i will never forget from that case were uh rep- this is bridgeport connecticut not far far from new york 1974 so it was straight over the air television stations and all this business and uh, reporters from cbs th- these are network reporters national reporters from cbs NBC and ABC came to the house, and I'll never forget the sight of them holding microphones up to this cat and saying, please, Sam, the cat's name was Sam, Sam, please say something. What do you think about this, Sam? Yeah, so what is your opinion on the political situation? Or who will win the Super Bowl? Congrats to our, our, we're real proud of our patriots, by the way. I know we have listeners in Seattle. Sorry, folks, but anyway, but anyway be that as it is, the football was not involved in the Bridgeport case. I didn't even see any football levitating. But in any case, uh, that, the cat, I, th- I thought the little girl was very good at throwing her voice, and I didn't see anything particularly odd about the cat. So I, I think this was sort of a non- non-paranormal cat, except for the environment in which the poor thing was living at the time. So going beyond that, what about non-domesticated animals? Like, uh, or well, I, I guess farm animals would be domesticated, but not like house-living animals or pets or whatever, like oxen, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, well uh, the case that stands out in my experience, and this is something I experienced with my own eyes, and I will, I will never forget it. Um, it and it was a very beautiful experience. Uh, and I, I refer to these as the phantom deer. Okay. Now, in the summer, of, this goes back into the seventies as well. In the summer of uh, late summer of seventy five, nineteen seventy five, a friend of mine called from Cortland, New York, because Cortland is famous for the Cortland apple, right? So they were all apple people around there. And uh, I remember the conversation because I took notes of it. And he said, "You're not going to believe this." And now, of course, that was a statement I'd been hearing a lot because it, it, this Bridgeport case was was less than a year before that. And he went on, "I guess it's a ghost thing, but you have to see it to believe it." Unquote. Now he wouldn't tell me any more about it. So I packed up my cameras, uh, a tape recorder, and notebooks. That's about all the technology we had in those days. And I headed uh, from, you know, the as a matter of fact, the tape recorder still used tape. I jumped in my 1968 Ford Fairlane and took the long drive from uh, to Cortland from my home in Connecticut. Now, when I got there, Tom, my friend, his name was Tom, still wouldn't tell me what was going on except to say that, uh, quote, it's always at night and you never know when it's going to happen, unquote. So just after sunset, we tramped uh, way out to the back of an orchard by the edge of some thick woods. And Tom said something like, uh, This is about as close as you can get, or we'll scare them. So we sat there on the ground for hours, and it was it was cold. That's the thing I remember too. It was cold, even though it was late August. Uh, I was dozing off against a tree when Tom, you know, poked me in the ribs, and it was a little after one in the morning. Uh, In silence, and in there was very thin moonlight. It was like a quarter, first quarter moon. Uh, I could just see. Tom point toward the edge of the woods, and these were about 100 yards away. Now, at first, I couldn't see anything. Then I thought there was a flicker of kind of soft white light among the trees, and then I was certain of it. There was a flicker, and then another, and then another. They were moving together through the trees and toward the edge of the orchard, these these lights. Then they emerged from the trees. It was very clear they were nine deer, clearly outlined in a glowing white, five of them with antlers. They were moving slowly and quietly along, and they're feeding on the ground as they went, inching their way into the orchard. Well, words can't really describe the feeling that came over me, Ben. It, it was 
utter wonder. Like the first time I'd ever gone out as a child and looked up at the stars, I mean, that, that kind of thing. Everything's new, you know. Mm. At the same time, there was a maddening feeling of familiarity with this scene. That's the best word I can find. And I just couldn't put my finger on it. It was one of, of the holiest experiences I've ever had. I, I, that, that, that's the best word I can, I can describe uh, that, that with. Uh, but I was also very lucky. Tom said he discovered these phantom deer while camping here uh, with his younger brother about a week and a half before. Now, the boy had been asleep and hadn't seen it. Now, Tom, who hadn't told anyone about this for fear of being branded a nutcase, uh, had come out again on the following two nights, and on the second night at least he'd seen the deer again just before dawn. And then, three nights later, there they were again, he said, just after midnight. And uh, that's when he found out they were skittish because he tried to kind of get close. So they, they were conscious of his presence, whatever these were. Now, according to Tom, uh, they'd seen him, and they, hadn't, they had not scattered back into the woods as deer would. They just disappeared. And he described it as, you know, like, like a light turning off. Now, and I guess not now you look back and you think of the, the Coggleton mystery cat or, or ghost cat, and that's the way the ladies almost described them, you know, had they known about lights in the 1840s or electric lights anyway. Uh, so as I say, um, he didn't tell anyone else about this, and considering my paranormal proclivities, I guess he considered that I was crazy enough to share the tale with him, because, you know, it was one of these things that I had to tell somebody, I hear that a lot too. So anyway... The day after our sheared sighting, uh, we went back to the orchard in daylight, and there were no deer tracks, no droppings, nothing. We examined the w nearby woods also, no wires, no lights, nothing would ever to indicate any sort of hoax. I knew this guy very well, you know, and he was, he was not that sort of a person. Uh, we even searched the treetops with binoculars. to see if there any wires or anything like that, nothing. And I guess this is kind of the middle of nowhere. Now, uh, yes, I did snap photos during that sighting, and I, 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 we rushed to have them developed the next day, and every frame was hopelessly fogged. It wasn't black or dark, it just fogged, mm. as if it was, it was, as if it was just a uh, pea soup fog. You know? Now, I stayed for two more nights, uh, but I never saw the deer again, and I felt an uncanny kind of a loss because of that. I, know, I, I couldn't put my finger on it. Now, after my visit, Tom said he never saw the deer again either. So this was apparently a very short duration event. Uh, we might say two worlds uh, intersected uh, briefly and uh, with a beautiful experience resulting. So um, I, do we have a caller? I think we have a caller. Hello, welcome to Behind the Paranormal. Oh, we don't have a caller. Okay, all right, well, let's forget why I said that. Were these the ghosts of dead deer? Well, uh Somehow that just didn't do it for me, you know, just, just as, as it was there during the whole 70s. I was confused by that this is more than just spirits and all this business. So why did it feel so transforming, this experience with these deer, if that's what they were? And as I often say on the show, if I knew then what I think I know now, I'd say it was a deeply precious experience of a very beautiful parallel reality, one that was almost disturbingly familiar. And now I look back, and Ben will know what I'm talking about here, I'm thinking of the good world. Mm. And that, that's something that we've gotten into on other shows, and we got into it on a national show, and 3,000 people wrote to us, but uh, that, that's also that we're going to deal with that in the last chapter of our, of our book uh, that's, that's upcoming this year, uh, Cosmic Journey. But anyway, we'll more on that later. So I've been, I'd uh, just been through that terrible Bridgeport poltergeist experience uh, less than a year before, as I say, but this was something at the opposite end of the paranormal spectrum, this deer thing. It demonstrated to me the true implications of the paranormal. I mean the real paranormal, you know, the big picture, not most of the silly stuff uh, you see on, on TV and all this business, you know, or, or even in my work with Church Exorcist or with Ed Lorraine Warren. Um, it was all far beyond that, so uh, an aspect of the paranormal that perhaps should get more emphasis. No, I, I agree with that, but beyond ghost pets and phantom deer, there are cryptids, which we've we've sort of touched on in the show, but like specific examples, but not exactly why they're there. We've had questions about it, but never really really talked about it. So, uh, like animals unclassified uh, by uh, science, like the like sea and lake monsters, of course, Bigfoot. Uh, but even beyond that, are there are uh, animals that just shouldn't be where they are? Yeah, displaced animals. Uh, cryptozoologists refer to those as animal erratics. 
E-R-R-A-T-I-C-S, animal erratics. Uh, I, I kind of laugh at that because I'm interested in geology, too, and uh, a lot of the stones we have around here in New England are referred to as, as glacial erratics, okay? So uh, these animals were not put here by the glaciers, but uh, they're, they're nevertheless where they shouldn't be. Um, there was a, One thing that really stands out for me was the mysterious kangaroo outbreak in Illinois and Indiana in the 1970s, okay? Now, kangaroos, of course, are from Australia, and I even saw some of them when I was there for only a part of a day in 1979. But in this case, they were seen hopping around the American landscape, and even in some suburbs. Now, oddly, nobody, including police who saw them, could, could catch them. Now, early on October 18, 1974, a lot of things happened in 1974, paranormal areas. Uh, the Chicago police got a call from a man who swore there was a five-foot-tall kangaroo in his backyard. Now, not only did the feisty roo avoid capture, they, they, believe it or not, they, they even tried to handcuff it. Their hands really are about the right size. But it kicked and punched officers Leo Siagi and Michael Byrne. And if, if you, uh, you heard about you know, kangaroo boxing, that, that actually is done in Australia if you're crazy enough. And, and the, uh, we have a lot of Australian listeners, too, so you're nice people, but I don't know about this kangaroo boxing. Kangaroos really can kick you and punch you, and you don't want to be in the way when they, when they do it. So anyway, these two officers certainly didn't want to shoot it, so they just gave up and called for backup. When other officers, including animal control, arrived, the roo just bounded over a fence and went hopping off down the street. Now, uh, what was apparently the same mysterious critter was reported by a number of witnesses the following week in Chicago's northwestern suburbs. It was even seen digging through garbage cans, okay? So it couldn't have been any kind of ghost. Or... Anyway, so one man said he found one in his front porch. And the media aptly dubbed it the Chicago Hopper, okay? Chicago Hopper? Chicago Hopper, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a gangster from, like, the 30s. Well, this is Chicago we're talking about here. And no offense true. to any of our listeners in Chicago. Anyway, the obvious answer, of course, is that the Jolly Jumper here was a refugee from some zoo or circus, or Chicago being a major port city on the Great Lakes and might have escaped from some foreign ship. But a thorough investigation by the police and others of all these, and the media of all these possible origins revealed no missing marsupials, right? So one magazine columnist later on, I believe that was in New Science magazine in December of that year, suggested that, quote, the affair is a healthy joke made up by the Chicago policeman and continued by a subtle kind of mass hysteria, unquote. I know for a fact this guy was not a psychologist. Well, if you know any police officers, and most of us do, you know that they do not joke with the public or the media, especially not when they're on duty. Right. So anyway, in late October of 1974, uh, kangaroos began turning up in Indiana even while they were still appearing in Chicago. Now, that's not too far geographically from the Indiana border, but from the distances and timing of the sightings, it seems impossible that a single animal could be responsible. Now, on November 2nd, 1974, three people saw a kangaroo in Plano, Indiana, and within half an hour, another one was seen 50 miles away on the outskirts of Chicago. The sightings continued in the Indiana, Illinois, until November 25th, when the whole affair stopped suddenly as it started. No more kangaroos in the American Midwest. Now, two American researchers, uh, that's David Feidler, I believe it's pronounced, uh, whom we don't know, and Lauren Coleman, whom we do know, uh, decided to investigate. Now, they found uh, what we always find, that these bizarre incidents are never isolated. In Fate magazine in April 1978, you can look it up, uh, Feidler and Coleman reported other such incidents from a number of states. And by the way, we know Lauren Coleman to be a very honest and painstaking researcher. Uh, matter of fact, he's probably the world's primary cryptozoologist. So even as that article was published, uh, there were reports of kangaroo encounters in and around Waukesha, Wisconsin. Researchers, including Coleman, got plaster casts of kangaroo tracks at that point. Also in April of 78, two men near Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, got a photo of a kangaroo they stumbled on in the woods. The following year, there were kangaroo sightings in Canada, specifically in Ontario and New Brunswick. Uh, one of the more notable kangaroo flaps took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma, not quite, not very near Chicago. That was in 1981. In one case, uh, a man walked into a coffee shop in Tulsa and suddenly announced that he'd nearly had an accident in his pickup truck while trying to avoid a kangaroo in the road, but in doing that, he'd struck and killed a second kangaroo. 
everybody said, yeah, right, but they all went outside, and sure enough, there was the, the dead Rue in the back of this guy's truck for everyone to see. And everyone included not only the coffee shop customers, but two Oklahoma State cops. The man then drove off into the blue with the evidence, and one of the officers later said, I wish I'd taken a picture. Well, so do I. Imagine if that explained uh, the sightings of spring Jack back in the Victorian age. Oh, gosh. Well, yeah, that, that, that's a, that, we ought to do a show on him. That was really weird. The, <laughs> but that, he was uh, disconcertingly human. Uh, this fellow who'd, who'd jump around, I, I literally go around and he'd sort of, a, he would, I don't think he hurt anybody, but he would like attack or, or startle people a, uh, in the street late at night in like London. And then all of a sudden he, he'd jump over these huge walls and fences and <laughs> escape. And nobody ever caught him. So, first one of the mad scientists testing new sorts of shoes or flubber or something. I don't know. <laughs> it's just the precursor to flubber. Probably. <laughs> but moving into, now for something entirely different, moving into the darkest, uh, the deepest, darkest depths of cryptozoology, uh, residents of Hamburg, Arkansas, reported a kangaroo-like creature that terrorized the region in 1934. Yeah, th- this kind of brings the whole kangaroo thing to a new level. Um, they said it looked like a kangaroo, but it was huge and unlike anything they'd ever seen before. One eyewitness was a local minister, a certain Reverend W.J. Hancock. He said, I've looked it up, he really existed. He said it was, quote, as fast as lightning and looked like a giant kangaroo running and leaping across the field, unquote. Now, while these sightings were going on, uh, something was killing and eating dogs, ducks, and geese. Kangaroos, of course, are vegetarians, like you, Ben. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, when was the last time you ate a goose? Anyway, uh, bands of armed men from the area tracked this creature into the hills, but they could not find it. Well, we feel that cases uh, like that are, you know, they lend weight to our multiverse theories. Well, I think so, too. And I, I think uh, the, uh, the appearances and disappearances of animals like this are reminiscent of appearances and disappearances of people mm. uh, that we've talked about a lot and we have in our files. These, uh, there were, um, I'm thinking of people who um, have simply vanished. And you, know, you realize that there are over 100,000 people a year who vanish without a trace. Now, now, obviously, probably the majority of those are people who want to vanish. You know, they're running from creditors or from their spouse or somebody. You know, but, but others are, are completely unexplained, and there's no motivation for it, seemingly, and, and no known reason for it. And uh, one looks back to reports that are pretty well documented from um, really centuries in the past up until the present day of people who simply uh, vanish and then appear in uh, another place far away almost instantaneously. Uh, I'm thinking of a, um, uh, there was a, a, a was it uh, Brazil? I believe it was a Brazilian army, I don't have it in front of me, but a Brazilian army contingent. Uh, they, were, they were speaking with uh, their senior non-commissioned officer, you know, top sergeant, uh, during some sort of uh, exercise. And he was in the middle of his, his, his uh, instructions to them, and all of a sudden he vanished in front of like 35 guys. Right? And then he simultaneously reappeared somewhere else, uh, like 100 miles away, near Rio. And everybody, well, what the heck is going on? And finally, then they never really solved it. Of course, Brazil is a hotbed of UFO sightings and things of this kind. And uh, sure enough, there, uh, there you go, uh, with possible flaps and connections as that we see between these these uh, areas or window areas, as they are beginning to be called, and uh, that sort of thing. So I think we're dealing with a lot of world overlaps and correlations between parallel worlds. Uh, our good friend Mark D'Antonio, who is uh, a very very feet on the ground scientist, he's an astronomer, but he's also open minded, and he's the Mutual UFO Network's national director of uh, video and audio. I should say video and uh, photo analysis, and he's been on the show a number of times. He's co-hosted with Ben, and uh, he um, uh, believes that they, he calls them world intersects. He, he himself had a, a dog experience with a paranormal dog. You remember that, Ben? He, was, he said it on the air a couple times. Good, good pun. He keeps his feet on the ground. He kicked a ghost dog. Well, we didn't kick it. He just sort of, he was in his... Um, he oh, worked, he stepped on it. That's right. He stepped on it, yeah. He uh, stepped uh, on, on this this transparent dog that just sort of wandered into his laboratory, and the dog responded, as, I mean, uh, not as if it could see him, but that it felt kind of his foot, and off it rent, rent, went out the door, and I, he thought maybe he was losing it, but then <laughs> there, were, uh, there were a lot of other incidents of that kind. So again, we think that they're not spirits or anything like this. I mean, that's the only explanation most people can think of, because they don't know about quantum physics. 
And so we're dealing with parallel intersecting worlds here. And that seems to be the way our universe, or multiverse, if you will, is constructed. And uh, there you go. So uh, certain places uh, certain su- they are subject to repeated manifestations of UFOs, strange creatures, and so on for that reason. So if, had I been in Illinois and, and the Chicago area in 1974, I would have looked not just for kangaroos, but perhaps for other forms of paranormal phenomena. And I did, I did uh, look up some correlating uh, evidence there and uh, some uh, other sources, and there were a lot of UFO sightings uh, higher than there had been at any point that year, uh, in the fall of 1974, in that part of the country, uh, Chicago, Illinois, uh, and um, Indiana, and in the vicinity of uh, the Great Lakes in general. So whether that was connected, I don't know. Well, it just seems like it's an active area in the first place. Well, everywhere is active, but it, oddly enough, I mean, it's near the Great Lakes. Like, I'm not quite sure about the geology of the land, but I'm pretty sure that would lend um, lend a hand to any sort of paranormal happenings. Well, that's the thing. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't want to... Uh, give away our open line show in a few weeks, but we we received a question from uh, a, a woman in Connecticut asking uh, how much limestone is there um, under the the particular area of Litchfield County that we've been researching since '05, and uh, where Bigfoot sightings have been reported, UFOs, uh, the house we started in, uh, all sorts of interesting uh, what people might consider ghost phenomena going on, but seemingly unrelated, you know, strange species being seen, things of this kind. Mm. And uh, limestone is often thought of in the uh, pop paranormal community as being one of the conductors of energies, uh, perhaps uh, electromagnetic fields that, that does it. But, but they really, I've never really found any 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 truth to that. Uh, one of the things that that they often will will pin on limestone is the whole residual haunting thing. In other words, what you're seeing is not necessarily a a, a ghost that's right there or a kangaroo or some strange animal. You're seeing a um, uh, a recording on the environment somehow projected to your mind or whatever, or the minds of many people at the same time. And I, you know, I was an early advocate of that theory, like way back, but I soon decided that that's not good enough either. First of all, what, what is it recorded on? And they say, well, maybe limestone, but you'd have to have a fantastic amount of iron oxide in, uh, in, in, in the, the area, the surrounding soil, the stone wall, whatever it is in the house. And that's just not likely. Uh, in order to record anything, you know, even any kind of sound, let alone a visual image. So I just don't think there's anything to that, and whoever says it doesn't know their geology. So anyway. All right, I guess we're down to our last two minutes here, so why don't we start our announcements, Ben? Indeed. So you can visit our website at BehindTheParanormal.com, where you can find nearly 600 free podcasts of past shows from uh, both ON 1240 and our four-and-a-half-year run on CBS Radio, along with special shows and podcasts. And you can find my books, too. Uh, Bill Hall isn't the only one who writes books uh, on Amazon.com, Amazon Kindle, and Barnes & Noble Nook. And if you buy them directly at BehindTheParanormal.com, I will be happy to sign them for you, and you will help us keep all those podcasts free. Also on our website, you'll find direct links to several charities Ben and I uh, mentioned. Uh, and so please uh, check that out, too. They're a really good cause. All right, so next Monday, February 9th, here on ON 1240 and ONWorldwide.com, we will rebroadcast show number 565 from December 15th, I should say, 2014, and that is the uh, researcher Christopher O'Brien and cattle mutilation mysteries. Uh, But we'll be back live for the following week, which is February uh, 16th, with author William J. Hall and his forthcoming book, The Haunted House Diaries. And that's about uh, nothing less than our investigation of that paranormal hotspot in central Connecticut that we talk off- so often about. And I'm just going to qualify that by saying, keep your eye on the Facebook and our website, too, because we, we, we might do a show next week. I have to find out if... Um if uh, there's something that's going on that I thought was going on, and uh, we'll, we'll let our station know in plenty of, of time. So anyway, we, we, we probably will rebroadcast next week, but we're not sure. Anyway, we leave you this evening with a thought uh, from the great Czech-slash-French writer Milan Kundera. Mankind's true moral test consists of its attitude toward those who are at its mercy, animals. And in this respect, mankind has suffered a fundamental debacle, so fundamental that all others stem from it. I'm Paul Eno. And I'm Ben Eno. And thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey. And we shall see you next time. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.